joined us for today's Accelerate to Industry program on goal setting and tracking. And we're very excited to have our friends and partners from Gelled Win here to lead that session. So I'm going to do quick introductions and then we will turn it over to our guests. Uh, leading our session today will be Cameron Jacobs. She's the University Relations Program Manager for Gelled Win and supports recruiting for the Early Careers Program, which are internships and early career rotations. Cameron's got almost nine years of experience in talent acquisition and manufacturing, HR, operations, legal, compliance. She's worked in uh, financial services industries for LPL Financial, Aerotech, First Investors, just to name a few among all the other things she's done. Cameron's originally from Winsboro, South Carolina, and has a degree from Winthrop University. University in Business Administration and Management. So we're glad to have Cameron Jacobs from Gelled Wynn here. Also joining us is Nicole Schachter from Gelled Wynn. She's a talent development business partner, born and raised in Charlotte, uh, lived here almost her whole life, has a bachelor's degree from UNC Greensboro in psychology and a bachelor of arts in German language, literature, and culture as well. Nicole's got eight years of experience working in the manufacturing industry, focusing on areas of talent development and learning. She's a certified Hogan coach and MBTI practitioner and finds joy guiding managers through self-reflection so they can make changes to increase engagement in their teams. She also re recently received her MBA from Western Governors University and is working on her certification as a developmental mission, a Dimensions International Master Trainer over the next few months. And Nicole currently calls Nuremberg, Germany home and when not in lockdown, loves to go dancing, scuba diving and searching for the best bad tie in town in Germany. I would imagine that would be fun to find. And so we're glad to have Nicole Schachter here with us. And also from Gelled Wynn, Holly Milanese, the manager of corporate onboarding programs and university relations for Gelled Wynn. Uh, she oversees the early careers program, uh, as well as the internship program and the 24-month early career rotational. Holly graduated in 2008 with a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from UNC Charlotte and was involved in research and dedicated time to her minors of sociology, women's studies, and gerontology, and now serves as the president of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Alumni Council and holds a Master's of Science in Organizational Development and Executive Coaching Certificate as well. So really excited to have Cameron, Nicole, and Holly here to lead our session on goal setting and tracking. So without further ado, please welcome our guest from Gelled Wynn. Thank you so much for that introduction, Jay. I have the privilege of kicking off our conversation today around the goal of goals. Now, I'm not going to promise that will be the only pun in today's conversation, but it will get us started. Just a couple housekeeping items before we get going and we jump into the agenda, the first is please use the chat box. Holly will be manning that chat box for us and she'll feed us those answers. Also, if you're comfortable, I would love for you to turn on your video camera. It's a little odd for us, those of us that are talking today, not to see your faces, it makes it feel more like a presentation than a conversation. So it really helps if you're comfortable turning on your video camera. I do understand a lot of us are home right now, there are dogs and other crazy things and kids running around, so you may not want to do that. But if you're comfortable doing that, um, I definitely encourage it and would really appreciate it. And lastly, this is interactive. So please use the chat box, use your video cameras. Feel free to ask questions, but we will have some time for questions at the end. So Holly will be collecting those, and then at the very end, we'll go back through them. I also have four different screens open right now. So you may see me look in some different places. I'll try to keep looking forward because I know it's weird if I look this way and I'm talking at you, but just know I have a lot of different things going on. So the first thing I would like to do before we jump into agendas is share an image with you. And now we're gonna test my technical aptitude at sharing my screen. All right, there we go. Can I get some thumbs up, some smiles, some head nods if you can see this image? Fantastic. So either just by a show of hands or by using the chat box, how many of you think that this picture is real? I see one hand. What do we got in the chat box, Holly? I see some hands popping up. Yeah, you can use that hand notification too. So now I got three. A few people, everyone's, uh, a couple of people said real, one person said not real. Yeah. So that's kind of what I was expecting, because in the age of Photoshop and 923 BuzzFeed articles about if Kylie Jenner did actually Photoshop her last Instagram photo, we're expecting to see pictures that are not real. But this photo is actually very real. It hasn't been, manip been manipulated at all. This couple 
is on top of Victoria Falls in Zambia. Victoria Falls is about 108 meters high, and they are actually at that level peering over the edge in a naturally forming rock pool, just right up there at the top where you can jump in and go swimming and you're in no danger at all of being swept over the edge. You can do this three months out of the year and it is at the very top of my bucket list. So using the chat box, I would really appreciate it if you could help me out and write some of your bucket list items. What is on the top of your list? And I think right now, a lot of them are probably going to be travel oriented, especially if you've been sitting in lockdown for a while. We have some coming in, Nicole, going to Japan, Asia, going to Australia and New Zealand, visit Greece. All right, so they're all travel related. I think it's a, it's a mental thing right now because of quarantine for such a long time. The reason I wanted to ask you about your bucket list items is because these are goals that you've set. And typically nobody tells you to write a bucket list. It's just something that you do naturally. And it's this phenomenon. A lot of us do this. A lot of us have these bucket list items. A lot of us set New Year's resolutions. And we do this goal setting process naturally, but we don't put a lot of thought behind the impact of setting these goals. We don't really think about the strategy behind them until we're right there at the goal. And we don't consider if they're smart and not smart as in hanging over the side of a waterfall, but smart as in the smart goal format, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Now, when we're talking about it from Geldwin's perspective, we have to understand the impact of every goal because it deals with our organizational strategy. And to successfully achieve that, achieve that organizational strategy, we also need to make sure that our goals are leading up to business success and that each individual goal is created in that SMART format so that it's strong, it will be achieved, the departmental goals will then be achieved, and then we will again achieve those organizational goals. So we're doing that same process that you do when you're setting those bucket list items, but we have to plan for it and we have to put a lot of thought into it. So my purpose today is to share with you how we practice goal setting at Geldwin. And it's my hope that by doing that, you'll have a better understanding of the roles that goals play within our organization, so that you can also take some of the processes that we use and the strategies that we implement and use them for your academic or your personal goals, as well as any professional goals that you might have. And we're going to do that by first reviewing pretty much a case study of how Geldwin uses goals in our business, the impact that they have in our success in the industry, and then also going over some techniques and strategies that we teach our managers and employees so that they have successful goals by the time they get to the end of the year. And we're gonna start this conversation by talking about performance management. So let's do some word association. When you hear performance management, what is one word that pops into your mind? Growth. Okay. That's one. Metrics, resources. Very good. Metrics. Metrics. So as, as more of these, what was it? Positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement. I feel like I may have primed you guys too well for this conversation. But metrics is something that comes up quite a lot when we ask this question before a performance management training. And we always ask this question. Now, the number one answer we get when people hear performance management, they think review, they think rating. Sometimes we get people who are very brutally honest and they say nervous, hate, dread. They don't wanna go through this process because it's all focused around that review and that evaluation at the end of the year. But you guys kind of hit the nail on the head there. What we need to be thinking about when we think performance management is about growth and about goals specifically. So what you're seeing now on screen is Geldwin's performance management cycle. And it's made up of three interconnected phases and two thirds of our performance management cycle is specifically focused around goals. So of course, goal setting would be one of those, but the other one is development planning. And both of these phases are just set up so that employees go in and write down goals, business goals and development goals. The performance evaluation phase is the one that gets the most attention from employees and from managers because it's tied to merit and it's tied to evaluation. And that can be the one that we always focus on. 
But by doing that, we miss the big point of performance management. It's all around setting up those strong goals at the beginning of the year. Everyone needs to take part in this process. So even if you join outside of one of these phases, within 30 days, you'll have goals in the system. If you transfer departments within 30 days, you have new goals in the system. If you transfer managers, you sit down with your manager, you have a conversation, you reframe those goals and you add them into the system. How many of you write down your bucket list items? Again, you can just raise your hand or you can write in the chat. See one hand, two hands, three. So not, not too many. And I think that's common. I think bucket list items are something we keep in our head. I have a bucket list book that I bought from Amazon because I'm one of those types of people. But it's very important to write down your goals. Writing down goals, just having them written down somewhere, computer, anywhere. You're already 1.2 to 1.4 times more successful in completing those goals. If you then share a goal with someone, you're even more successful. And then if you track that goal throughout the year, you're already increasing your success pretty much to as high as it can go. And this is the importance when we talk about performance evaluation, because we have a two-step process. We have the typical performance evaluation, where at the end of the year, the employee does a self-evaluation, the manager reviews, they have a discussion, we send a form, all is good. But we also include a mid-year, which happens six months into the year, six months after goal setting and development planning. And this is when the manager and the employee sit down together and they track their progress. They sit down and they say, where are we and where do they wanna go? And has anything changed where we need to change where our goals are going? And this is so important because sometimes we think we want something, we're on this path and then we stop tracking it. So imagine if you're trying to get a degree and you just completely stopped counting your credits. It's going to be very difficult to get that degree in the time frame that you wanted to do it. You have to stop and track. And there are some goals we do this with. A degree is a great example. We all have those trackers on our home pages. But with other goals, we just let that fall to the wayside. So this process, when we are looking at it from a business perspective, it accomplishes two main things for us. One, it ensures that everyone has goals and that they're written down and that they can be tracked. So it's increasing that transparency and it's ensuring that they're shared. So just by doing that, we're building up success. And then it also formally records them in a system that we can use to evaluate at the very end of the year and then also at that mid-year. And it's going to also track the changes that we make. So if a goal does need to be altered, we can do that easily in the system. The second principle we follow when it comes to goal setting is that there are two types of goals and there needs to be a clear differentiation between the two. How many of you have been whitewater rafting at the Whitewater Center in Charlotte? See some hands. You can also use the little hand feature in Zoom. Okay, so I'm seeing, seeing a few people. If you haven't been, this is how it works. You show up at the Whitewater Center with your team. They arm you with a helmet and a paddle in a life jacket in approximately about 10 minutes of safety instructions, which makes you an expert. Then you pile into this boat and your guide sits on the back, kind of half out of the boat, real cool because they know what they're doing. And they shout out instructions. So they shout out how many times you paddle, if you're paddling right, if you're heading left, if you're crouching down. And they guide you through these various courses. So as a team building activity, the former organization, so Holly and Cameron didn't get to experience this with me, we went down the level four rapids, which are the hardest rapids at the Whitewater Center, and we hit a particularly bumpy patch. And that familiar guiding voice at the back of the boat that sits back there real cool, all of a sudden disappeared and was floating down the river past the boat. And there was a moment among us in the boat, felt like a sitcom almost, where we were like, oh, this isn't ideal. And then everybody did something. So some people splashed around a little bit with their paddle. I think one person lost their paddle. Some went left, some tried to go right. It was very chaotic. Eventually our boat got slammed into a wall, water kept pushing up against us and we ultimately capsized. We were all doing something, something we thought was very important at that moment. But ultimately our goal of getting the boat through those rapids came collapsing down on us and we ended flipped up, side down, going down the river. When we talk about performance goals, we're trying to prevent that from happening to our company in the industry. And to do that, we have to make sure everything's aligned, that we don't lose our guide. 
and he doesn't go floating down the river before us. We do this by having our CEO set the organizational vision. And then he is going to talk to his team, share his vision, his mission, and the organizational goals and strategies. His team will then take that vision, communicate it out, but then change the goals so they fit to the team. So the CHRO is going to have a different set of goals for his team than our CFO. And by the time those goals get to me, they're going to look very different to the goals that my colleagues have in engineering. But that red thread between what I'm doing feeds right back into that organizational strategy. It provides me with a purpose on why I'm doing what I'm doing. So when we talk about performance goals, they're not about the employee and that can sound harsh, but they're about me doing my job so that children stays successful in the industry. Development goals is where we focus on the employee, but this isn't just aimlessly picked out of thin air either. What we do is we sit down and we consider where do I wanna go with my career? Where am I now? And how do I fill those gaps? And that's a process we need to use with pretty much any goal. What is the current situation? What would I like the current situation to look like? And what is missing to get me there? It could also be about honing your current skills so that you feel better in your current role. The emphasis here is that when we talk about performance goals, they're ensuring that Jeldwin stays a leader in the industry and that those organizational goals are being met. When we talk about development planning, we're talking about investing in employees but also ensuring that that talent pipeline is built out so people can get where they'd like to in their careers. Goal setting is very interesting because it is a top-down and a bottom-up approach. And this factor is reflected in the system that we use because managers can cascade goals. But we do it like this because managers have the bigger picture. They know what's going on from an organizational standpoint and where the department needs to go so that they can then align their department's goals with their manager's goals. Again, feeding up through that red thread. That is such an important aspect of how we structure goals. But the employee needs to have a role in this too because they're the ones doing the work. They're coming up with the methodology. They're using their expertise to fill in the gaps that the manager may not know. And this whole process reflects very closely to what you do in academia. So what do you normally do on the very first day of class? I'll give you a hint. Professors usually always refer back to this and say, you should have read it. Nothing you in the chat. Guesses? Nothing in the chat. Not yet. Professors, professors would be so oh, disappointed. Syllabus. Uh, <laughs> Someone says ignore the syllabus, but several people write syllabus. <laughs> we can see who wrote which chat, so just be careful. <laughs> Right, so yeah, you, you read the syllabus and what is it that's so critical that the professor provides on that syllabus? Why does it matter? <laughs> the correct answer is not that it doesn't. <laughs> okay, so someone did say uh, course learning outcomes. All right, so learning objectives, expectations, resources. The professor hopefully knows what they want you to get out of this class. They know the process of this entire course, and they can tell you before you even start working on the class what you need to accomplish by the end of it. That gives you the big picture, but it's up to you as the student to come up with your study plan, to come up with the metho methodology that works best for you, and then to do the work. And that's where you come in from that bottom-up approach, and you meet the professor in the middle. They set those expectations. They tell you the learning objectives, that big picture, what you're going to get out of it. And then you fill in the gaps. How do I learn as an individual? How can I accomplish these goals? Now, when we think about development planning, think about a college advisor. It looks a little different because your college advisor can't tell you what you want to do in your career. That takes self-reflection on your part. You have to come with that information because you can throw them a curveball. Maybe you're studying finance and your next career move is a dolphin trainer. There is no way your college advisor is going to know that. You have to provide that information. But what the college advisor does is use their experience to give you advice. That is their role from the top down. Your role, again, as the person receiving the advice is to agree on those steps and do the work. So now let's just take 30 seconds here. And I would like everyone, hopefully, have something to write on. If not, I know you're in front of the computer. So just type it down. 
write down a personal, an academic, or a professional goal. And I'm going to write one down as well. All right, so if you're still thinking or you're still writing, keep doing that. But either in the chat box or just by showing me your hand, rate how familiar you are with SMART goals. So one would be never heard of them before, which is great. I get to be your first SMART goal experience. Five means you could probably do this next part for me. Um, so just give me, if, if I can see you, if you have your video on, just give me a few fingers or, or one finger. Just be careful what finger you give me. And if you're using the chat box, just go ahead and type it in. All right, I see a five. What do we have in the chat box, Holly? We have a, we have a lot of experts, Nicole, a lot of fours and fives. Ooh, good, good. Hadn't heard about SMART until I made it into the corporate world. I'm glad that it's popping up earlier. I was shocked when I first heard about SMART. All right, so we are going to go through SMART. And if you're an expert, hopefully I can give you one or two new takeaways when we talk about SMART, but we'll also talk about it from a business perspective. When we talk about S, since you got all our experts, you already know the, the secret of the acronym, we're talking about specifics. This means if I grab a complete stranger that you have never seen before in your life and they know nothing about you, I bring them in and I show them the goal that you just wrote down. They know exactly who is doing what and what needs to be done very clearly so that they could take that goal and maybe even do it themselves. That's the level of detail that you need to have in your goal to make sure that it's successful. My favorite goal, and the one that I see over and over and over again, is I want to improve my communication skills. I see this goal a minimum of 100 times every time goal setting comes around. So in the chat, what does communication skills mean to you? Public speaking. Okay. Influence, properly expressing ideas and concepts. All right, so just there we have pretty much three different ideas on, pub, on communication. Nicole, someone mentioned it's very, it could be very broad. It can be verbal, it can be written, nonverbal, knowledge, effectively yeah. communicating an idea. It can be everything. Uh, the most interesting answer I ever received, someone said GIFs or GIFs, depending on how you want to pronounce it. We're not going to have that debate here today. Um, but the, this uh, particular employee was working on a team and the team always sent gifts back and forth. And she just didn't understand that form of communication. And that is what she was looking to achieve, was figuring out how to use those so she could feel as part of the team. So it's a very broad definition of what we include in communication skills. But we have to define that. Are you working on interpersonal skills? Even with presentation skills, what does that mean? Are you working on fillers? Are we working on executive presence? Are we working on approachability, improbability? Those specific details need to be defined. So take a look at your goal and take about 30 seconds to review and make sure that it's meeting that specific criteria. And really think about it like it's the first time you're looking at it, that you're that stranger. I'm gonna do this too here. All right, so let's move on to M. The M stands for measurable. Goals need to have tangible evidence that they have been completed. What you should ask yourself when we come to M is how do I know when I'm done? How do I know when this has been achieved? We're gonna come back to M in just a minute, but for now, we're gonna move on to A. So A stands for achievable. Most of us know that saying, shoot for the moon, you'll land among the stars. I like to add, but don't shoot for Pluto because you'll end up drifting in space. That's too far. We don't have the technology to get us there yet. Goals should push you. They should take you out of your comfort zone, but you don't wanna live 24 seven in that discomfort zone. It needs to be a mix. There has to be a challenge. You also need to have the resources to complete the goal and those resources need to be under your control. 
So if my boss comes to me and says, Nicole, I want you to join the NBA, there's a host of problems with that goal as far as achievable is concerned. But one of them is I'm 5'3". I have no control over how tall I am. That's something that no matter what else I do, no matter how much I practice basketball, I'm not going to be able to change. And therefore that goal will not be achievable. You also have to make sure that you're separating expectations from goals. So you don't wanna go the other way and make it too easy. So saying, I'm gonna be on time for every meeting, that's an expectation. That's not a goal. That's just something you should be doing already. You again, you wanna step into that discomfort zone. It's not a fun place to be. We wanna retreat when we're there, but you don't wanna be there all the time. You need to find that balance. So when we're talking about A, ask yourself, do I have the resources and skills needed for this? And if not, can I acquire them? Can I get them under my control? And sometimes just doing that piece is an extra goal that you need to accomplish before you can move on to the goal that you've set. Now, R stands for relevant. When we talk about relevant in terms of Geldwin, all performance goals, like I mentioned, have to be aligned to that organizational strategy. Development goals, too, need to be aligned to your career aspirations and filling in those gaps or honing in skills that you currently have. But if we're thinking on a personal aspect, ask yourself, what meaningful impact will this goal have for me? And you don't have to overthink this one, right? So I have a degree in psychology. I had to take biological anthropology 101 in my process to get that degree. I did not want to become the next bones, but it was still on my process map. What was the impact of that class? I need to get these three science credits and I never want to have to do a lab again. That was my impact. That's why it mattered. If it's a personal goal, I want to go to Zambia because that's going to fulfill something in me, a desire that I've had for a very long time. And I will feel more fulfilled and I will feel happier. And it's important to write that in the goal because when things get hard, when life starts throwing a million and 53 things at you, when a pandemic hits, these things happen. We sometimes lose ourselves to our goals and we don't accomplish them. But if you write in your goal exactly why you're doing it, it can motivate you and push you forward. So again, take a minute, look at your goal and find that impact, find that red thread. Why does this goal matter to you? And write that down as part of the goal. Lastly, the T, I think everyone knows the T. It stands for time, time-based, time-focused, whatever you want to call it, just remember time. The key here is practical sense of urgency. If a friend comes up and says, I'm getting a master's degree, most of us react like, wow, that's great. If they follow it up with, yeah, over 12 years, that reaction changes a little bit. Mainly at what university are you doing this? H how? We need to create a reasonable deadline and that practical sense of urgency. Can't get that master's degree in a month. But we also don't wanna spread it out over 12 years because we need to create that deadline and that pressure to get to that goal. So just make sure that you have that deadline in there. Now, I did mention you were going to talk a little bit more about the measurable and this is because the measurable is tricky. That M trips a lot of people up Now, typically, um, our employees are friends in finance and production. This is no problem for them. They have their numbers. They have their percentages. They can tell us about quality and productivity and end of quarter costs and, and all of that great stuff. But things get dicey when we start moving into HR, when we get into R&D. Things start to get a little bit more confusing. So for example, if my boss says, Nicole, I need you to implement a learning management system. Just use the chat to let me know what the metric is for that. Am I going to measure it by participants in, in the LMS? Should I be using courses to measure it? What is the metric to implement a learning management system? This is something like LinkedIn Learning, but we are gonna implement our own. Do we have any answers yet, Holly? Not yet. Oh, it'll depend. It's just getting it up and running. Okay. Anyone else want to take a guess? 
number of courses completed. Okay, very good. I like it. Any other metrics? How would you measure successful completion of this goal if this was your goal? So some other ones were whether or not there's specific number of participants or courses completed, impact levels. Okay. Uh, connecting it to the learning objectives, so implementing learning objectives into actionable items. Again, so all of these are fantastic metrics. They would be metrics that we would typically use, except for one of them. Um, they would be metrics that we would typically use to measure the steps in the implementation process. But the essential metric that we're using is just the goal itself. Is it implemented? Is it up? Is it running? And we get a lot of these questions. My goal is to write a, a handbook. How do I measure that? Did you write the handbook? Can you check that off a list? If you can tally it, if you can check it off a list, if you can cross it off a list, that's a metric. Don't let that trip you up when it comes to M. Sometimes the goal in and of itself is the metric. And sometimes metrics need to be planned and benchmarked beforehand. So if we go back to my all-time favorite goal, communication skills, that's something that you need to ask someone beforehand for a little bit of feedback. And then at the end of whatever training process you're going through, ask again for feedback. You need to think about the way you're going to measure it and you have to benchmark it. So at the end of the day, you know if you've improved. Now, I'm a huge proponent of SMART because I think it does something very, very powerful. A goal at its core is a wish. So I can say my goal is to go to Zambia one day, or I can say I wish I could go to Zambia one day. Those are essentially the same thing. But what SMART does is it takes a wish and it makes it very real. And real things are achievable. Not only that, but wishes happen to you. You say, I got my wish. Not I went and got it. Right? It happened to me but you achieve your goals. There's something that you are in control of. So SMART is incredibly powerful. It is a fantastic tool because it takes something that you want to happen, this wish that you have, and changes it into something that you are in charge of, that you can make happen. And this is where I would, the thought I would like to leave you with. When we talk about success in goals, Sometimes it's more like a rock climbing wall than a ladder. The next move is not always up. It may be going sideways. It may even be going back down the wall a little bit so that you can again reorient yourself where you are before you make that next move. You may be using a completely different route than the person that came before you. It's also important to note that there are more and less secure footholds when you're rock climbing. There are riskier moves and it's up to the climber to decide which moves they wanna take next. In the very same way, your goals are your creation and they are your responsibility. And if you set them up for success, that success is ultimately in your hands. And now I'll pass it off to Cameron. Thanks so much, Nicole. I have learned a lot more. I've heard that presentation before, but uh, hearing it a second time, um, I've learned some, some extra tidbits of information, so that's exciting. Um, so I won't uh, dive a little bit further in here, but uh, as Jay mentioned, I am Cameron Jacobs. I am from Winsboro, South Carolina. I uh, came to the area because I went to Winthrop University uh, in Rock Hill, um, and I have a bachelor's degree in uh, business administration uh, with a concentration in management. Uh, so I spent some time in my career in talent acquisition, uh, recruiting for a number of different uh, skill sets. Uh, and then I transitioned over recently with Jeldwin um, from talent acquisition to our talent development team, where I am on our early careers team with Holly. <laughs> um, and I support most of our um, early career program um, recruiting efforts. And so what I'll chat with you all about today is a little bit more about our early career programs and then also about goal setting for our early career programs and how it's a little bit different from our standard or traditional um, um, uh, process for our full-time employees. So in terms of our, full, our, our early career programs, so when I say early career programs, I mean our summer internship program as well as our early career rotational program. So just some information about these two programs. So as you see here, our summer internship program is a 10 week program over the summer. Um, and it has six different functions that we typically recruit for. So IT operations, engineering, commercial, um, which is our sales and marketing, uh, HR and finance. And so most of our opportunities are here within the Charlotte area, but there are a few opportunities that are within plant facilities 
um, across the United States. Uh, so for our internship positions, we typically um, seek out our junior level um, candidates or junior or higher. Um, so um, graduation years being December 2021 in this case, or, or for this year, as well as uh, to May 2022. Um, usually we have, uh, we seek out GPAs that are 3.0 or higher. And we do, even though we have different functions or tracks that we hire within, um, we do um, seek all majors because we hire based on competencies or skill sets or, or traits, sorry. So leadership abilities or the ability to overcome adversity or a number of those different competencies. So we really do focus our, our efforts in recruiting to all majors because you can fit obviously within a number of those different functions or tracks. So this particular year, our internship program is starting on June the 7th and will be ending on August the 13th. Uh, so our early career rotational program does have some similarities. Um, we do uh, still hire within the same six functions or tracks. So IT, operations, engineering, commercial, HR, and finance. Um, but our early career rotational program is a little bit more extensive. So it's a two-year program that has four rotations that are six months each. Um, three of those rotations are typically within the Charlotte area for most of our tracks. And then one uh, rotation is within a, within a plant location. So it could be within any of our plant facilities across the United States. Um, in this case, we um, seek out individuals who have already graduated, um, still having a GPA of 3.0 or higher. Um, we do still seek out all majors. Um, the uh, recruiting process is essentially the same. Um, but with this program for this summer, they're going to be starting on June the 14th. So I will note that we are kind of tying up some of our recruiting for um, these programs for this summer, but I did want to kind of share the information um, for the overall program so that you all have some perspective there. Um, so with this program, so our summer internship program is supposed to be a feeder program into our early career rotation program, which is why I mentioned that our summer internship program, we typically hire a number of our um, junior level individuals because the goal is for you to come and have um, to gain working experience or leadership experience for a summer um, within those functions or tracks um, and then come back potentially the next summer um, within a similar track where we, we actually have some individuals who have done uh, an internship in one track and come back in a, diff in a different track but um, the goal is for you to do an internship, you know, in, in a certain function uh, one summer, then come back the next summer uh, to start the uh, early career rotational program. But as you can see here, it is, it is supposed to be a feeder program into the early career rotational program. So uh, if you are interested in the summer internship program, there is, you know, opportunities for, you know, future advancement within the company if Dolan is, is an employer of choice. So um, as uh, Nicole mentioned, typically our um, goal setting process or even our, um, our performance management process is usually a one, uh, it's one year long performance cycle for full time employment. So it has the entire process, which is goal setting, development planning, and then performance evaluations. Um, but since the early career programs is a little bit different and the model is different, we don't follow the same um, timeline. And so there's a few differentiators. Overall, the goal setting process is much more condensed yet um, thorough in a sense that it ensures a lot more success within the program, but also within your career overall. Um, so some of the differentiators is that goals are due at varying times of the year. So our internship program, since it is a 10 week program over the summer, the goals are due much sooner in the program, uh, usually within two to three weeks of the program start date. And our, the goals are directly associated with some of the objectives or projects that you're gonna be working on over the summer or assigned to um, during that 10 weeks. Um, the early career rotational program goals are set within four weeks of the early of the uh, rotation start date. And those are essentially still um, connected to the objectives for those different rotations. However, they are done with each rotation. So you have different goals that you set for each of the four rotations and you work with your manager on those, um, those goals as well. Um, also, additional training and support is provided to interns and associates on how to set effective goals. So we have a lot of lunch and learns and different opportunities like web, uh, uh, seminars where leaders are covering various topics and development, such as goal setting um, and other topics. Um, but with these types of events, interns and associates are able to get insight from leaders who have uh, either developed goals for themselves or for the company for quite some time within their career. Um, also, um, Nicole is, has been a great resource for Jeldwin in general um, because uh, she actually has 
um, been a great resource for us in creating um, presentations where she's able to share this type of content, but also additional content in terms of performance management as well. Um, on goals, um, on the entire performance management process, on a number of different things too. Uh, so similarly, um, goals should be developed by the uh, intern or the associate, but they'll have help from their manager, as well as um, they'll be reviewed by the program manager. Um, and then also with our early career program associates, um, this, this information is entered within our uh, HR system uh, internally, but we also have a performance management form that'll be on our next page that I'll kind of talk you through um, as well. So the form that you see here, as mentioned, is our performance management form. Um, so performance management process itself is, um, it provides a framework for ongoing communication for all parties involved um, regarding goals, uh, development action, performance, and such. And so with a form such as this, um, our early career rotational associates, uh, the process is usually, they will enter their goals um, or, or take a first stab or basic framework for their goals. Um, with this, they will have a basic conversation with their managers regarding their goals and objectives. Um, their particular managers for those rotations, as mentioned, because they do their goals for each rotation. Um, the manager will have a chance to assess their goals to help them to kind of refi refine them and then also enhance those goals to make sure that they are smart, as Nicole mentioned. Um, so the process not only ends there. So after they are entered into this form, uh, they also send them over to the program team, which is myself and Holly. Um, and at that point, we'll have a chance to review them and then also do another kind of polishing or fine. Um, and I think that this process or method ensures that um, the goals are reviewed three to four times in the process. Um, the goals are smart. The goals are also within line of you know, company goals and team goals. And that essentially the, there's a roadmap to success that's been created. I think that having someone to kind of review and refine the goals, make sure that um, these goals are definitely attainable for the associates. Um, but I think that it gives the associates a, a sense of ease as well, because in most cases, these individuals are setting goals for the first time when they enter the program. Um, and goals can be a little bit intimidating, especially with the formula that we have. They don't necessarily have to be because you have resources in general. So um, first time goal setting tips. So um, creating goals, like I mentioned, for the first time can be a bit frightening, but here's a few tips that'll kind of ease your mind. Um, so for one, <laughs> um, don't go it alone. So utilize resources like your manager, um, program managers, if you have those, um, and team members. So once you create a goals framework, all of the aforementioned can essentially be a sounding board or help you to proofread and refine your goals. Um, also utilize print resources. So in this case, we have the performance uh, management form. Um, if there are any additional print resources that are provided to you, definitely feel free to use those as a framework or to at least build out uh, a basic model for um, building those goals. Also, um, you all are right on track with attending events such as this. I think that this is perfect and I wish I would have attended more events like this when I was in your, your um, seats. Um, but I think you're in a perfect spot to gain insight prior to joining um, the workforce um, or even you know, early in your career to have um, more insight on building goals or building effective goals. So attend more events like this. Um, secondly, uh, know the objectives and work backwards. So I say this because knowing your company's goals and objectives will help you to create your own goals. If you have an idea of your position's objectives and what the company has set out to accomplish within a certain time period, you can better understand how your goal or your role itself impacts the big, bigger picture and can kind of build a goal based on that connection. Um, three, smart. Um, so I know that Nicole already covered that, so I won't cover that in depth, but uh, make sure the goal is specific, measurable, attainable, uh, relevant, and time-based. And then also four, um, set goals that motivate you. So I put a, a quote down um, below to set goals that excite you um, and scare you at the same time. Um, so, but, but in a good way. So goals should definitely stretch you or, or stretch goals, should, it's, they're a good thing. So make sure that your goals are attainable, but with a little bit more effort than you usually apply. So there isn't much more satisfaction or for me um, than crushing a goal that is a little bit beyond my reach, um, but it's fun all the way through. Um, so in essence, or as I tie up, I will say that first time goal setting can be intimidating, but it really, really doesn't have to be. There's a lot of resources that you can use 
um, that are around you um, or even attending events like this that can give you a little bit more ease in the process. So um, even beyond this point, I know we'll kind of share our information, but um, if you guys need some assistance beyond this presentation, I'm definitely happy to help. So I'll pass it back over to Nicole. Right. Well, thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy days to, to be part of this conversation and this discussion. I saw some questions come in from the chat box. So Holly, I, the ones I saw were about the program and you are the expert there. So I will, I will toss it right back to Cameron and you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Please feel free to drop any additional questions in the box. I was trying to organize it based on Nicole versus early career. So Nicole, I do have one question for you. And then yes, you're right. The rest are for early career. Uh, there, the question is, how is time and measurement different when it comes to SMART? So someone mentioned that they seem very similar. So sometimes they can be the same thing. So time can be one of your measurables. But what we're talking about when we're considering time is a deadline. So again, let's go back to saying I want to improve my communication skills, specifically my ability to speak in public without using fillers. What I may do in that process is at the very beginning, I'm going to give a presentation, have somebody tally how many fillers that I'm using. And then I'm going to say, I want to decrease my use of fillers by at least 50%. Then I'll set my strategy and my steps. I'm going to go and attend a couple different Toastmaster events. I'm going to watch a bunch of TED Talks and analyze how they do that. I'm going to do the worst thing ever and record myself giving a presentation and watch it back a few times. And I want to make sure I accomplish that. And again, here comes that deadline that T in three months. I wanna make sure I get all of this done in three months. So now I have my measurable. I wanna decrease my fillers, my ums, my ahs by 50%. I also have some other measurables. I wanna attend you know, five Toastmaster events. I wanna see 10 TED Talks. These are things I can say, check, done, tallied, I can count them. And I need to do this in three months. And that's the time focus. So you have a measurable, how do you know it's done? I know it's done because I did these things and I decreased my fillers by 50% and I need to do it by the T by those three months. So that's the difference. One is really, did I get it done? And the other one is, did I get it done in the time frame that I wanted to get it done by? So that's the, the, the difference there. Good question though. Hey, Nicole, one more for you here. Uh, how does, how, sorry, how does one have goals that are personal as well as professional? Do they need to be synergistic or can they be completely different? If we can change an organization, does our professional goal change? How far ahead does one want their goals to reflect? That was, that was a lot of questions all at once. <laughs> I think <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe the, yeah, the difference between professional and- <laughs> Yeah, let's and start there. <laughs> um, so can you have professional and personal goals? Absolutely, you can have professional goals, you can have personal goals, you can have academic goals. Those are usually our three big pools. Um, I'll just use myself as an example. So one of my professional goals is to step into a management role within two years. So that attains specifically to my career. Does it cross over into a personal goal as well? Absolutely. So they can be the same. But then I also have a personal goal that I wanna learn, this is actually the goal I wrote down, a little embarrassing, that I wanna learn a specific choreography to a, a song that I absolutely love. That's gonna have no impact on my career whatsoever. That's not a professional goal, but it's still a goal that I have. I mean, maybe it will be, maybe someone at one point will ask me to do the dance and I'll become CEO, but probably not. So that is something that is going to be very personal to me that I still want to achieve. It's going to have that impact on my life. When we think about it in the context of gelled women, when we think about performance goals and development goals, our performance goals, they, ha they have nothing to do with the employee and the employee development. Will they still get development out of those goals? Absolutely, because they're still very much going to push you out of comfort zones. You're going to have to acquire different skills. So if you're setting up an Excel document, you may have to learn a little bit about VBA or different formulas, and that will increase your development, but really it's focused on the success of the company. And then you have development goals, which could be completely structured on, I want to improve my Excel skills so that I can get to the next step in my career path or that I can perform better in my current role. So that's the difference there. And you can most definitely have both. And then you can also be working on a master's program and that's your academic goal. And they're going to cross over, there will be overlap, but you can have those three different, those different zones. I think the other one was how far ahead do you want to plan? That's up to you. And that also has to do with what the goal is. Um, so when we talk about performance goals, we say within a year. 
So they're all short-term goals because the company runs a fiscal year. So that's when our goals line up. Sometimes you'll repeat the same goal a few times, but we're typically within that one year frame. Personal goals, it's going to be dependent on what the goal is. If my goal is to get a master's degree, for instance, I'm going to leave myself two years to do that. And um, if I know that's something I would like to do is a trip around the world, that's gonna cost a lot of money. So that's something that I may plan very far in advance for. So I can start saving, take, checking off some of those steps. So it's contingent on what is included in the goal, how far out you wanna plan. Now we will say when it comes to how many goals that you should have, typically the sweet spot is around three to five short-term goals. So three to five goals that you wanna accomplish within one year. More than that, you get distracted by different goals that are going on, it's hard to focus, especially when it comes to professional goals. Less than that, you're not gonna feel challenged. So we do say that sweet spot is really in between three to five. Did I answer all of them? Was that all the questions? You did, yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Wonderful. Well, we just have uh, four other questions and they're all related to early career programs. So Cameron, you and I both can, can jump in here. The first question is, are there summer programs for PhD students? So Cam, I don't know if you want me to answer that or you can take that either one. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll be happy to, to jump in here. So the answer to the question, we don't actually necessarily, I guess I would say discriminate based on majors or programs. So we really are finding individuals who are interested in our type of internship program. And with that does come exposure to a particular function. And then also a number of professional development uh, sessions that we have throughout the summer. So I really think it's based on what your interest is, right? So if you're at the point in your career where you're open to having that early career development, if that fits for you, maybe you haven't had a lot of professional experience, that may make sense even at a PhD level. So we're not going to say no to someone because they're master's versus PhD versus even a bachelor's when it comes to the action. Now, the work that you do, of course, will vary. I'm, I'm imagining that if you're at a PhD level, yes, I can imagine that the projects that you're going to be given is going to be at a different level than someone coming out directly from for undergrad. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, there's also another question about can we join internship in January, like spring 2021? Also a question about recruiting timeline. So let me answer both of these at once here. So at this time, Jeldwin, our internship program is in the summer. So that does run, it's 10 weeks, it begins in June and it runs through August. And at, the, that, at this time, uh, that is the only internship program that we have available. In terms of recruiting though, I will share with you all a little trick today, a little tip and a little trick. So we actually do recruit typically in the fall for the following summer. So I know that means you have to look a little bit ahead of schedule, but basically the work that we're doing, pretty heavy lifting with recruiting is actually happening in September, October. That's when Cameron and I are scheduling interviews. Well, Cameron, Cameron's the one that's doing all the work, <laughs> so interviewing all of our candidates. So that's happening um, in the fall. Now we do have a spring recruiting cycle and it is typically to fill whatever remaining positions we have, but it's a little bit, it's limited. So my recommendation is if you are interested in either an early career program or the, the internship program, I would get out in front of it and um, start working with us early in the fall semester. So we'll have that posted. Follow us on LinkedIn too, because we'll, we'll post it on our personal LinkedIn accounts as well. Um, then we've got just another question here about authorization for international students. I know that that's a question that comes up often. Uh, we, I will share with you that we do not uh, offer any sponsorship opportunities for international students. So um, yeah, feel free to, if you have any questions about how that may affect you individually, feel free to reach out to us and we can answer those questions one-on-one. -on -one. All right, there's a question about pay difference. Um, so yes, just last question here. For the internship program and the early career rotational program, the pay is consistent across the board for those programs, but where that will likely change, of course, is after the end of the program itself. So depending on what role you, you go into and what function you go into, that's when you'll see a pay difference. Also in the early career rotational program, everybody is eligible for merit increases as well based on their performance. Because as, as Nicole very clearly showed for us on that performance management cycle, we are paid for performance. So based on how you uh, effectively work through your goals uh, and how you're able to contribute to the company ultimately helps us have those, those conversations, compensation conversations with our associates. So I think I covered all the questions. Anything else? Oh, Holly, I think you, you've got it, uh, got it covered there really well. So um, 
Everyone, thank you so much for being a part of today's program and really want to say a big thanks to Cameron, to Nicole, and to Holly for the excellent information they've delivered to you. You've been given a crash course in not only personal development, but many of you, you know, into your career faster than you think will find yourself in management and leadership roles where you have to start setting goals for teams and your team. And that's kind of front of brain for me right now, because at the university, we're in evaluation cycle uh, right now. Uh, two of my employees are in their evaluation term, and then another two will be this summer because of when they, uh, their, their job classifications. But um, this is something that's always um, on the front and should be on the front of your mind. So I do encourage you to connect to our speakers today on LinkedIn. Um, they're all very responsive and great about uh, responding to questions. So Cameron, Nicole, Holly, sorry for the inbox uh, explosion you're about to receive, uh, but uh, you should connect to, to uh, these folks. And we do want to again, thank them for their time and all the information that they have delivered for us. This is the last Accelerate to Industry session for this semester, but look for more over the summer as we continue to collaborate with other A2I academic partners and do more virtual programming. And we hope uh, if you're uh, still in your um, program in the fall that we're able to do these things in person. So we're all going to cross our fingers and hope for that. But again, thank you everyone for being here today. And again, thank you to Nicole Cameron and Holly from Gelled Wind for sharing their insight and their time and answering so many great questions. Um, we really appreciate their support and appreciate all of you. Um, and as you are finishing up your semesters, we hope you stay safe um, and that you stay strong and have a great summer uh, in front of you. And we look forward to seeing you and talking to you again. And for those of you entering into the workforce, stay in touch. Uh, we are glad that you're out there representing this university as well. So take care, everyone. Have a great uh, rest of your week and a wonderful and safe weekend. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye.